Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. It's always one of those scary expressions on Wall Street in particular when somebody says, this time it's different. And yet it is different, especially the economic conditions that are the operating system of today's world. Where once people invested in things that grow in the agrarian age or in things that could be made with sweat and steel in the manufacturing age. Today, no matter how hard politicians may try and take us back, investing is in human capital, in ideas, in imagination, and in zeros and ones. Things like R&D, marketing, design, and software are much harder to measure and to value. And while we see lower barriers to entry today, we also see the correspondingly high valuations of those intangibles. Just look at Uber or Airbnb. And to try and make sense of all of this, I'm joined today here on Radio Who, What, Why by Jonathan Haskell. He's a professor of economics at Imperial College in London and director of the doctoral program at the school. He's taught at the University of Bristol in the London Business School and has been a visiting professor at the Tuck School at Dartmouth and at the Stern School at NYU. He's also a member of the Bank of England's Rate Setting Monetary Policy Committee and the author of Capitalism Without Capital. Jonathan Haskell, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Jeff. Absolute pleasure to be with you. We talk a lot today. We hear about the economy today being referred to as the information economy. But you really go broader than that in talking about this intangible economy. Define, first of all, what that is. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jeff. I, I think we are a little broader than the information economy. Um, I think the types of assets that we are interested in, that the economy is increasingly investing in, contain some information assets, notably databases and software, which are both intangible assets. You know, you, you, the, 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 you can't sort of drop them on your foot sort of thing, um, but contain some other types of assets, which I think are not so much information assets, but possibly more relational assets. So, for example, the reputation that companies uh, have, you know, they build very assiduously and, uh, you know, m the market research and so on uh, is very important in building all of that. The kind of networks that companies invest in as well, um, we're interested in that. And the kind of organizational capital that firms have as well. You know, the reason why, you know, Kmart and Walmart feel like very different organizations, even though if you buy shoes, it's exactly the same pair of shoes. So I think we're a little bit broader uh, than just information assets. Uh, and that's why uh, we focus on intangible assets as possibly a slightly better, you know, collective term uh, for the new types of assets that companies are increasingly investing in. When we talk about intangible assets, to what extent are we really talking about human capital, human assets? Uh, some human capital is sort of behind all of this because clearly you need talented software writers uh, to write your software, talented data analytics people to interrogate the data, you know, m movie designers and set designers and people like that, you, you know, to do that kind of thing. But the key point is that the assets which Apple and Google and these intangible intensive companies own are owned by the company themselves rather than the individual worker. So that, for example, to take a rather morbid example, if you'll forgive me, Jeff, um, you know, when Steve Jobs very sadly passed away, there was obviously an enormous amount of reputational capital built up in him, embodied in him personally, but Apple didn't completely fall to pieces. So it's the ability of the companies themselves, like Apple in that regard, to sort of own a lot of this intangible capital, which I think distinguishes it from at least what economists talk about when they talk about human capital. They talk much more about the capital and the skills and the talents, as it were, which are owned by individuals. And that's sort of something, something a little bit different. And one of the points that you make is that it is much harder than to really measure, to define this kind of capital, both in terms of companies themselves trying to account for it, but even within the context of a larger GDP for a nation. Uh, that's right. And uh, accountants, uh, 
both national accountants who are putting together the GDP numbers and company accountants, you know, who are putting together obviously the company reports and the accounts and all that, have kind of struggled with this for quite a while. Uh, the trouble with many of these intangibles is, of course, there's often not an active market for them. So there's an active market for buildings and machines and vehicles and all the tangible assets which companies invest in, but there isn't an active market for many of the intangible assets. And um, so many accountants are very reluctant, therefore, to give them a value because they can't observe anything on the market. Um, the difficulty, however, is if one goes down that route, one ends up saying that, well, gosh, you know, we don't know what value to put on, I mentioned Apple before, we don't know what value to put on LinkedIn, we don't know what value to put on Uber, you know, all of these companies which have got very substantial, to go back, Jeff, to your original question, you know, information assets, very substantial relational assets. If we say that we don't know how to value them, then we've got a kind of a vast hole in our attempts to try to understand these companies. And in our book, which you very kindly mentioned, what, what we do is walk the readers through some of the research, which has tried to make that leap and under a number of assumptions, tried to get at some of these valuations and just count some of these numbers up and see if they're important. Isn't that what the equity markets have done a lot of in terms of creating some kind of value, assigning some kind of value for these companies? No, absolutely, Jeff. I mean, that is right. And um, what we argue in the book is there is tremendous opportunities for really talented, you know, analysts to really get close to these companies and really understand them. The trouble with the equity markets, of course, is they're extremely volatile. So the value of, I don't know, Yahoo, for example, used to be incredibly large and then overnight it can be incredibly small. So equity markets are one way of trying to read off those values. But because they are so, um, uh, so volatile, we instead try to look at a more sort of cost basis. We try to at least look in, in terms of the economy as a whole and ask the question, how much are firms actually spending in dollars and cents or in you know, euros or in British pounds, if I can talk about British pounds coming from London at the moment, um, how much are they actually spending on software? How much are they spending on design? How much are they spending on branding? And we try to build up a picture of how much the economies uh, are spending on these various assets. And, and so those therefore get at this issue uh, via that direction. In a way, it seems that we need to find an entirely new way to measure this because what we're really doing is trying to measure these intangibles and the things that you're talking about in the same way we ascribe value and measured things in an agricultural or a manufacturing economy. Well, I think that's right. And I think for the economy as a whole and for large sectors of the economy, I think that's got a good chance of working reasonably well. Some you know, companies are going to invest in R&D, going to invest in design, going to invest in software, and it's going to work very well. Others, it's not going to work out very well. Um, but in an aggregate, we might imagine we can get some aggregate measure of how much they're investing. It is going to be much more difficult at an individual company level because of the various properties of intangibles because of the way that some might succeed uh, and some might fail. And as I say, what, what, what we try to do is, is describe, if you did that exercise, how different would investment in GDP look you know, for, the, for the major economies as a whole. And talk about that, how different it would look, first of all, for the companies themselves and how traditional accounting methods really don't take into account so much of what we're talking about. Yeah, so, so beginning with the companies them, the, themselves, I mean, we spend a bit of time discussing that. We spend a bit of time discussing the reluctance of the accountancy firms uh, to go in this direction. Um, but then there just appears to be a lot of evidence that if you don't want to go in this direction, you don't want to make these measurements, you are just you know, creating a very large hole in your understanding about what these companies actually are. So, for example... Some very interesting work by a London Business School professor called Alex Edmonds took companies who won the prize for the best company to work at 
uh, and ask the question, could you make money by investing in these companies, uh, you, you know, once you knew that they'd won the prize? And, and if all of the value of in the intangible value of winning those types of prizes was embodied in the stock price, you shouldn't be able to make any extra money. Actually, you can make money uh, by making those sorts of investments. So again, showing uh, that there does seem to be a systematic, you know, misvaluation at the company level um, of the types of intangible investments that increasingly companies find very important. And talk about the analysis of that and how the, the systems for analyzing that are somewhat different. Well, th- most of the analysis, I- 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 if Jeff, you know, this is your question, um, has been done somewhat by the national accountants who are trying to get at, as I say, some economy-wide measure of how tangibles and intangibles stack up. Uh, and what they've done is they've tried to, you know, look, for example, at how much firms are spending on their, for example, software engineers, uh, and how much plausibly uh, that might have spe- that spending that they're doing, you know, might reasonably contribute uh, and, and build the types of, you know, software intangible assets uh, which are important for many companies. So there's there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, there's a whole kind of uh, system around the uh, national accounts, uh, which is an attempt uh, to try to get at those types of questions. How does risk enter into the equation in trying to value this? Uh, in in a very difficult way. I mean, you know, risk uh, ex post is easy to observe. It's easy to now say, well, gosh, you know, Uber's done really well and uh, Microsoft have done really well and, you know, Yahoo maybe hasn't done quite so well. Um, but ex ante, we just simply don't know. So, uh, again, I think this is where in the future there is a potentially very important role for analysts and for observers of companies to really get close to the companies and really start to analyze everything that's you know very much behind their balance sheets uh, so that those types of analysts and 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 then the clients to whom you, you know they would then want to interact um, can just much better understand you know the intangible performance uh, uh, of, of, of the of the of the companies you know whom they can get close to are we moving towards something else or something that's even harder to understand and harder to value as more AI enters into the business equation? Um, I think that's right. Uh, and we talk a little bit about AI. And, and in, a, in a sense, um, I think it's a bit of a case study of uh, you know what we're going on about. So um, I don't want to give you a long lecture, Jeff, but uh, if you just forgive me just for a second. Sure. I mean, one, one way of thinking about AI um, think about the Google Cats project, for example. You know this um, this tremendous project where Google, you know, are investing uh, all this money in an attempt to get the computer to recognise a picture of a cat, which turns out to be a it turns out to be a very complicated picture because computers are very good at doing these calculations, and you know, three-year-old children can recognise a, a picture of a cat, but a computer has a lot of difficulty differentiating between a cat and a lion, or a cat and a leopard, or something like that. So what have Google done to do all of that? They have incredibly fast computers running, you know, absolutely amazingly engineered software, interrogating gigantic databases, in this case, pictures of cats. uh, But in other cases, I don't know, this might be banks looking for bank fraud. Uh, And in our type of language, how do we think about that? The incredibly fast computers, that's a piece of tangible capital, high quality tangible capital. The incredibly clever software is a piece of very high quality intangible capital. And then the database which they're interrogating again is a piece of very high quality intangible capital. And often, so so there are two things which follow from that. One is, as you suggest in your question, the more that uh, these types of companies, you know, look at these types of issues, the more that Google does this, the more that banking companies do this, the more that other companies do this sort of stuff, you know, the more important this um, bundle of intangible assets is going to come. And the second implication, as we were just discussing a second ago, is, of course, a lot of this investment, especially in databases, is often not counted. It's just too difficult to count. So that would, again, be another example where companies increasingly have an extraordinarily valuable asset, in this case, a database, um, but it's something which just doesn't appear on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. 
And, and it becomes harder and harder over, over time to sort of figure out on the other side the cost of barriers to entry in these businesses and how that impacts, because that changes over time. It might be that the cost is high in the early stages of AI because of the computing power and the databases, but over time those, those costs go down, the barriers to entry go down, and it all gets valued differently. Um, Absolutely. But that's, you know, how we would hope that the market economy would work. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what we would hope is that as cloud computing, for example, becomes more and more popular, then the costs of companies being able to use, again, if, if I may say to go back to our example, the costs of companies to be able to use these very fast computers, you know, running this software um, would get less and less and less. Um, I think the hope is that as those costs went down, you know, there would be more and more smart people, you know, working on these big problems. Uh, and that hopefully in the future was going to raise our productivity growth and, uh, you know, raise our prosperity. Of course, the, the two other factors that enter into the equation are both security and the proprietary nature of, of the whatever it might be. Uh, that that's right. So uh, I- even if it's the case that, uh, let us say, cloud computing gets very cheap, um, those types of issues around um, security and the proprietary nature um, get to be very important um, as well. And so we talk about that in the book. The, the other thing we talk about a little bit, if I must say, which I think is related, is, of course, once companies get good at doing this type of interrogation that I described, if they're also good at marketing, you know, the product that comes from this, I don't know, let us say an app that, you know, helps banks, you know, look for fraudulent behavior. If they good at, if they get good at marketing those, if they build up those types of relationships, you know, with the banks, uh, let, let us say as an example, then those synergies between the intangible assets get to be extremely powerful. Uh, and then you would expect, again, those companies to be disproportionately successful because they can combine together the skills and the talents around the intangible assets. And we think that that's quite a lot of the story around some of the, you know, the leading you know, information and tech firms uh, and part of the reason why they've been so successful. Part of it also is that there's a shorter and shorter life cycle to these products, that it's some kind of variation of Moore's Law that's at play and that no matter how great the marketing may be, for example, that the life cycle is shorter and the need for constant reinvention is so much greater. It is, and of course, if these companies can build up the skills and the talents and the synergies to be able to handle all of that and to be able to you know, cope well with a fast-changing market, uh, then they will do well. Um, otherwise, you know, the relentless market process, uh, I'm afraid, you know, will create great difficulties for them. Uh, And of course, that then feeds into the kind of ecosystem around the financing of these companies and the the possible reluctance uh, of banks and other institutions to provide the kind of seed corn finance that these companies, you know, need to start and grow. And, you know, maybe we need some rather different financial institutions who are going to cope with this, you know, perhaps more risky type of world. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's kind of the role that venture capital has filled in large measure. Uh, I mean, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here in London, you know, on the, on the end of the phone, and, you know, everybody in London, which is uh, financial capital of the world comparatively, uh, and doing very well in terms of venture capital relative to the rest of Europe, you know, looks at California with great uh, jealousy and reflects and wonders why it seems to be so successful in California. The other place we all look, of course, is Tel Aviv. Um, and it seems to be very difficult to produce those successful, you know, ecosystem and localized areas where the venture capital firms uh, do so well. As I say, I think we've made you know, quite a lot of progress of that in London, um, but we, we look with great, uh, 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 you know, with great envy uh, at places like California uh, and Tel Aviv and look and see how successful they've been. One of the things you talk about is an extension of that, that there's a, a kind of psychological mindset that goes with trying to understand this newer way of of looking at intangible assets. Um, that's right. It needs, I think, 
just a different, possibly a different turn in the imagination, um, looking, you know, beyond the company accounts, trying to understand better what it is that companies are doing. Um, that's on the one side. And then on the other side, we talk a little bit about the management of these very intangible intensive uh, companies. Um, because, you know, if you're going to be a manager, if you're going to be a manager of a tangible company, you're basically in charge of a large number of machines. So there are a lot of complicated supply chain issues, um, but those, but, but that's the sort of the nature of that type of exercise. If you're going to be a manager of an intangible intensive business, you're in charge of you know, a lot of individuals, you know, who are coders, who are writing software, who are doing marketing, you know, who are building up, you know, uh, relationships within the organization. That may be a very different type of managerial skill uh, to the ones required managing a whole load of, load of machines. Talk a little bit about why this is all so important, why this is important in terms of, of measuring the economy, of understanding the economy, how both companies and nations account for this, and, and really why it is such a critical need right now. I think it's important uh, because the intangible economy is just growing and growing and growing. I mean, often in economics and a lot of commentary about the economy, people want to comment on, you know, the, the latest and greatest thing and the particular events yesterday. But what we try to do in the book is talk about this much longer term trend towards the intangible economy. And essentially what we try to argue is that around, gosh, the late 90s, early 2000s, there was an overtaking in many developed economies led by the United States, I should say, uh, such that we're now in a situation where every dollar of tangible investment, that is to say investment in buildings and vehicles and, 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 and machines and so forth, it is, it, it, there's, there's a dollar 20 essentially uh, investment in intangible investment, software, design, uh, uh, databases, or all that kind of thing as best we can count it. So it's been one of those long-term trends and we now have a situation where that type of investment in intangibles exceeds that of tangibles. And so I think it's time to start really confronting the fact that we don't measure this stuff very well um, because it's just increasingly become more and more important. And we run the risk, therefore, of measuring things more and more precisely, but a, a, a less and less uh, you know, valuable area of the economy, uh, and 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 we run the risk, therefore, of potentially ignoring a more and more more and more important area of the economy. And we don't want to do that because we want to be able to make you know good policy decisions and understand what we're doing. You know, when we're looking at companies and economies. Right. And to the extent that we do ignore that, to the extent that we are not fully valuing this this intangible part of the economy, what are the costs we're going to pay for that if we don't catch up? I think those costs would be in a couple of areas. One is, you know, as we've been discussing, it's going to be much more difficult on a company basis to figure out what's important for companies and, 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 and how companies are going to be valued and, and what their prospects are. And that's going to be important for investors and financiers and, 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 in, and in, indeed employees, you know, making decisions about, uh, about where they're working. So that's on a very kind of company level basis. On a national level basis, I think we need to look at intangibles to make a better decision about how we're going to run economic policy. So, for example, uh, intangible capital tends to be quite mobile. It travels between different economies. Uh, in order to keep intangible uh, uh, investment going within economies, we probably have to be quite careful uh, uh, when we think about policy, for example, to make you know internationally competitive tax rates uh, and you know to provide a reasonably friendly business environment uh, so that we don 't run the risk of these intangible of this intangible capital just going off elsewhere. Taxation is one of the the big areas that really uh, has never caught up with any of this. No, I mean, I think it's one of those areas where, you know, companies and, 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 the, and, the, and the quite understandable reactions of individuals is moving much faster than policy can. Uh, there are a number of initiatives 
the OECD, for example, um, based in Paris, uh, kind of rich, rich countries, uh, sort of, sort of, cl- uh, you know, club of, uh, uh, of economic nations. Uh, they've got a number of plans to try to, you know, stop tax competition, um, but that's proved to be very difficult to do. And, um, you know, this is an area where e- economic policymakers have really got to up their game. One of the other things that you talk about in a little bit of time we have left is how this kind of intangible capital benefits the greater economy. You talk about the spillover effect, which is which is an inherent part of this kind of of economics. Talk about that. Yes, that's right. So if you think about, you know, we take the example of an of the iPhone. You know, before the iPhone came out. Um, if if people cast their minds back, you know, f- uh, smartphones looked all a bit weird. They had weird keyboards and folding out bits and aerials sticking up, which you you know you, you know you pushed up and down and all that kind of thing. The minute the iPhone came out, basically within about 18 months, every other smartphone shared that design. It just they just all looked rather the same, and that's what economists call a spillover, namely the design. It, with the intangible asset in the iPhone, the design of it, the look of it, and the feel of it uh, was something that was quickly copied by other firms. Uh, and so th- if there are a lot of spillovers going on, that is a potential kind of good side to the intangible economy because it's going to a- enable other firms to um, e- you know, build on the good practice uh, done by frontier firms uh, and spread the benefits of those types of new design of that type of work you know, throughout the whole economy. It, it also creates, to go back to the security issue we talked about before, but a greater need for protecting intellectual capital. This is exactly the dilemma, you know, which policymakers have struggled with. And as you rightly say, Jeff, if I'm going to come up with an idea and everybody's going to copy it, well, I've got pretty small incentive to come up with that, the idea in the first place. Um, and this is just a real bad, you know, dilemma for policymakers. Um, again, here in Europe, we have the feeling that in the U.S. you probably have this balance about right, namely relatively in some ways, you know, looser intellectual property, um, uh, 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 you know, regulations than we, ha- than we have here in Europe. Uh, and we think, therefore, that although there's the disincentive to do that initial investment, there is sufficient incentive uh, for firms to have follow-on investments and to put all of these different types of intangibles together, we think there's sufficient incentives to actually mean uh, that having relatively looser uh, intellectual property might be the right balance uh, to strike. But this is a difficult one, uh, and it may indeed vary quite a lot between different industries. Pharmaceutical may be very different to fashion, for example. Jonathan Haskell. Jonathan, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Absolute pleasure, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.